Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us this evening. I am going to get us started here. Uh, just a quick couple of quick things related to the technology to ensure that we're able to hear everyone uh, that we want to be able to hear and um, try to reduce any distractions that can, as I'm sure you all know, happen when um, large folks are gathered into one of these meetings. Uh, so before we start with introductions and begin, uh, just a couple of things related to Zoom. Um, I have muted everyone upon entry other than our panelists this evening. So I would just ask that you uh, double check on your panel that you are muted by going to the bottom left of your control panel and you'll see a microphone. If you could make sure that you are have the red line uh, between that, you're certainly welcome to, to have the video if you wanna just be there live or you can mute your video as well. Uh, but I just wanna make sure that you do that before we get started, just to ensure the audio works correctly. Great, thank you. So good evening and welcome to uh, a panel discussion uh, brought to you by Clarkson University's Graduate School and the Ray School of Business on the role of epidemiology, uh, especially in today's global pandemic. We're so thrilled that you could join us and we uh, certainly would invite you to share with anyone else that might want to hop on. They should be able to join at any time throughout the hour. Uh, but we have a great panel of faculty experts here this evening. Um, those that teach in the field and understand the, not only the epidemiology as a field, but its application to everything that we're experiencing today uh, and how it's important for healthcare managers and leaders as we look to the future and look to provide the solutions that the healthcare organizations are going to need in support of the critical role that this field is playing, uh, especially today. Uh, my name is Joshua Lefebvre. I'm the Director of Graduate Business Programs, and I'll be serving as a, a little bit of a moderator this evening on the technology side. Uh, so with that, I have a few more housekeeping items that I just wanted to make sure to talk with you about to uh, provide you with the opportunity to engage with our panelists this evening. There is a chat feature on Zoom. For those of you that are familiar with it, you should be able to see that box, or you can toggle to the more feature and click on chat. I see some folks have already said hello, so you certainly have found it. But we want you to have an opportunity to ask questions throughout the evening to our panelists, and I will be providing them with those questions and helping to moderate those. So if you do have a question this evening at any time, please feel free to type it into the group chat and you can see a, a picture here. Um, if anyone else that wants to type, hi, John, that is the, uh, the go-to um, test, if you will. Hi, everybody. <laughs> so you can type a question, uh, but I will moderate that and make sure to, to serve that back to John, who is our lead uh, moderator this evening, uh, and we'll try to get all of your questions answered either uh, during, but likely at the end of all of the questions when it's open dialogue and discussion. So with that, I'd like to introduce the moderator and our panelists this evening. Oop, not sure why that's slipping around. Uh, but Dr. John Hubberts is Associate Professor and Chair in Healthcare Management MBA program, working out of our Schenectady campus, which we refer to lovingly as our Capital Region campus. And John will be moderating tonight, uh, interviewing our two panelists. And we're so thrilled that uh, they're all able to join us today. We have Jane Oppenlander, Associate Professor for the Ray School of Business, and then finally, Eva Wilford, Instructor and a Biostatistics Doctoral Candidate. So with that, I have a couple of, I'm going to, the way that we're going to do this is we have the questions that John would like to engage with, and I'll put it up briefly, but then I'm going to eliminate the screen share that you, so that you can see everyone better. Uh, and if you have any difficulties, please feel free to type that into the chat or you can send me a private message and I'll certainly try to address any of those issues that pop up. Uh, so with that, I am actually going to stop my video and I am going to pass it on to John. So Dr. Hubbards, thank you so much for moderating tonight's panel and I turn it over to you. Thank you, thank you, Josh. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all tonight. Uh, I'm John Hubbards and I'm the uh, director of the Healthcare MBA program and broadcasting tonight from the Capital Region, along with Dr. Jane Oppenlander, who is uh, Associate Professor in the Ray School of Business, and also the Interim Director of the uh, bio, bio, excuse me, Bioethics Program at uh, Clarkson at the Capital Region campus. And also we're joined by Eva Williford, who is a doctoral student 
and uh, candidate at the you know, University of Albany School of Public Health. So uh, we'll talk tonight about the issues and origins of, of uh, epidemiology and its application. So to start off, one of the things that we hear all the time, and a lot of people probably never really heard about epidemiology before, but um, we're hearing a lot about it now. And with the pandemic, what is it? Eva? So, we'll um, ep you. Yes, so epidemiology is the study um, of the distribution and determinants of health outcomes for in specified populations. So what do you mean by that, the, in terms of populations? Um, so when looking in populations, we often in epidemiology look at certain groups. So looking at um, health outcomes in pregnant women, looking in adult men or children um, under the age of four. So we um, narrow down the focus by looking in specific populations. Okay. So what does an epidemiologist do all day? Um, so. A lot of it we work on designing and running studies, um, collecting data, analyzing data. Uh, some epidemiologists invest outbreaks. Um, then we also have to communicate the results uh, both to other epidemiologists, but then also to the general public. Uh -huh. Do most, pe most epidemiologists uh, spend a lot of time looking at the data or do they spend time looking or working with with individual patients so uh, what's the job like um we don't most epidemiologists do not work with individual patients very often we work a lot on uh setting up the study to then collect data so that once we get the data we can analyze it to then um help to inform policies, interventions, and also in, um, advanced research as well. Yeah. So how, how is this being applied today? Do you think most of the epidemiologists today are, uh, are kind of surprised at this pandemic? And did they see it coming because they saw it in the data? Or uh, you know, how, how does um, it relate to what they're doing, what they're seeing on the ground today? Well, so one area of epidemiology is infectious diseases. Uh, there's been a lot of infectious diseases. It includes uh, not only COVID-19, um, but also foodborne il illnesses such as like the E. coli that we see call, um, causes the uh, recalls of the Romaine lettuce, um, also like Ebola. Um, then they also have infectious diseases that are vector-borne. So uh, for example, Zika that was a few years ago that was transmitted by mosquitoes. So that's one branch of epidemiology. So are, are most epidemiologists specializing in, in, let's say, infectious diseases like that, or do um, any of them uh, look at chronic uh, conditions like, um, you know, uh, diabetes and heart disease and obesity and things like that? Yeah, a lot of the focus now, especially in public health, um, has moved away. I mean, infectious is so important, but chronic diseases are now the leading causes of death. Uh, especially in the developed countries. So there's a lot of focus on environmental exposures, cancer epidemiology, also um, a new field recently of epigenetics and looking at gen ep the epidemiology of genetics. And then also chronic diseases such as diabetes, heart disease. Um, there's a lot of interventions in uh, reducing the prevalence of diabetes in the population. Okay. So you know, what kinds of backgrounds and skills do you need to be, uh, need to have in order to be a um, epidemiologist? Um, it's a very broad uh, range of skills. So there's people with math and statistics backgrounds, um, science, including biology, but then also sociology, um, and a lot also clinicians such as nurses or doctors. Also can become epidemiologists or work very closely with them. I want to bring in uh, Dr. Openlander here, and uh, just uh, you and Eva teach a course titled uh, Managerial Epidemiology in uh, in our curriculum in our program. What is that? Right. We're, te we're teaching it right now, and it's a great time to be teaching epidemiology with so much out in the media we can draw from. It's a five week course that covers the important concepts in epidemiology. And we look at that from a managerial perspective. So what things about epidemiology do healthcare managers need to know to be effective in their jobs? And we tie what we do 
into the uh, managerial functions, such as planning. Uh, we cover five major topics. Uh, we begin with descriptive epidemiology, which really talks about how you formulate an epidemiological problem. And the way that's done to scope the problem is to define the person, the place, and the time. And that's called descriptive epidemiology. Uh, then we move on and we cover a unit in population health planning, because planning is an important managerial function. And many of the uh, population health initiatives, because things like diabetes, which uh, involve, in occasion, uh, underlying uh, social determinants of health, so socioeconomic factors. So those are often complex diseases that have many, many factors that influence the outcome. We call those risk factors. And so often to, to create interventions to address those, we want to um, engage other or, or a coalition of uh, agencies. It could be governmental, non-governmental, and they work together to create programs to help address some of the underlying risk factors that cause diabetes. One example is uh, a coalition up in Glens Falls, which the hospital works with, uh, believe it or not, the Southern Adirondack Library System. And they work with a local food pantry. And one way that we can combat uh, diabetes is, is with the reducing processed foods, eating more fresh foods. But some people, who live in rural areas or have transportation issues can't, can't reach those places where they can get fresh produce. So this program uh, takes local produce scraped from farmer's fields and then they distribute it to the various libraries in the Southern Adirondack region where people can come and get, and get fresh fruits and vegetables and improve their, the quality of, of their nutrition and hopefully that will be a way to reduce uh, the risk of diabetes. So that's an example of how uh, planning is an important part of, of uh, epidemiology. And what kind of data would an epidemiologist collect in order to evaluate whether that had an impact or not? Well, things that they actually, the food, we've looked at some of the food pantries data. Uh, they collect some demographic information. They look at who was accessing the, um, the program, where are they coming from, what is their age, what specific locality do they come from? And other things like, do they have access to transportation? Things like that. So, so part of the program is in fact collecting data to help better understand who is reaching, being reached by this program. Mm -hmm. Okay, so why is it important for uh, healthcare managers to know about epidemiology? Uh, that they would need to know uh, all about the science and how it's done and its applications? So could I go back just a second and finish sure. a couple more topics we cover? Sure. Sure. So, so part of that, uh, in part of that, looking into, for example, that food bank example, the, uh, the food pantry example, we look at uh, what we call analytic epidemiology, where we do take that data and we look to find associations between risk factors and outcomes. And outcome we've been talking about tonight is diabetes. And the way we do that is with creating epidemiological studies to collect and evaluate that data. And then we use a variety of health, health outcome measures and we cover those in, in our classes. And finally, we wrap up the course with a very timely topic, uh, disaster epidemiology, which is a field that's about 20 years old, and infectious disease epidemiology. Epidemiologists play a key role in both of those situations, primarily in investigation of outbreaks and in collecting data in disaster zones. So that's, that's the, the topics that we cover in the course. So uh, let me go back and, and address your question, John, why is it important? Um, for each of these topics, uh, we look at the key managerial functions. So things like planning, organizing, leading, and controlling. And so some examples are managers may often need to uh, review study designs that are proposed in their institution and they uh, have to do things like see if they're available funding. So they may have to budget for funding or material or personnel to conduct that study. They'll also need to make sure that, that the compliance associated with um, responsible conduct of research with human subjects 
is taken care of. And so they need to make sure things go to an IRB, an institutional review board. The purpose of an institutional review board is to make sure that, that human subjects are protected and that's a federal regulation. And so all of those things are managerial functions that, that they need to know about epidemiology. Also, uh, coalitions, such as we talked about with Lens Falls, they have to work with many community agencies addressing some of these chronic health conditions. And so they need to be able to uh, take initiatives, create initiatives, uh, find community partners to help them lead and organize some of these efforts. So the, um, Eva, have you been using the uh, current corona coronavirus crisis and information from that in your classes and you know if so how yeah so we um in our first week of class we take we took a look at a case report uh, in the new england journal of medicine and it was only a few days old the article and it was um from a long-term care facility in kings county washington which is one of the first hot spots so we uh, had a look at that and then we talked about some of the policies they've been seeing in the news that related to coronavirus we also looked at the Johns Hopkins coronavirus tracker uh, to see how the data vis visualization uh, could be used to communicate the spread of the disease. How, how, did that, uh, how did that work into the curriculum that you've got that Jane just described? Uh, well, that fit in and we were doing our intro. So it was about getting them to think about what public health is, uh, what do they see, um, in the media about public health and kind of how results of public health are communicated uh, to the public. We also, uh, not this week, but next week, are going to talk about um, an article also from the New England Journal of Medicine that talks about what studies um, should be done for COVID-19, which will um, go off of what they learned this past week about what the different study designs are in epidemiology. And, and we also use that we also used that article from Washington, the long-term care facility, to talk about how you define an epidemiological problem in terms of person, place, and time. The epidemiologists have really become you know, front and center in a lot of the uh, news these days. Um, how would you assess their performance in communicating to the public and either reassuring or uh, you know, pointing out things that the public should know about not only the, the epidemiology and the science of it, but also how it relates to everybody's daily lives. I, my impression is they're very factual because epidemiology is, relies on evidence. And by evidence, we mean, we mean data and studies. And so they, the epidemiologists are driven in their conclusions by what they see in data trends, and, and in study results. And we've been hearing that uh, often they reserve judgment because we don't have uh, studies that are completed yet. We're at the very early stages of the epidemic and there'll be many more studies to come. When we get into disaster epidemiology next week, we'll talk about some of the studies uh, in, in uh, disasters like Hurricane Katrina and the World Trade Center collapse on 9-11. Are epidemiologists involved in, uh, in emergency planning, and uh, such as for a pandemic, but for other you know, catastrophes and emergencies that uh, aren't necessarily infectious diseases, but could be uh, the result of you know, natural disasters and so forth? Yes. One of the important things that epidemiologists do, because they do this in, in, for chronic disease, for infectious disease, is they collect they collect data. They're, they know the various methodologies uh, for collecting data. So in a, in a disaster, such as a hurricane, uh, the usual ways that, that data may be collected, say as a survey on the internet or a phone interview, uh, those utilities may not be available, say, during a hurricane. So they do field work, in fact, where they go out and they will actually go into the field and take samples to try to very quickly assess what the health needs are for people who are hardest hit by the disaster. So that data can be used to inform policies and decisions to help bring relief to those people as quickly as possible. So particularly in disasters, the data collection skills that epidemiologists bring to the table every day 
for all kinds of studies are particularly useful in a disaster situation. Evan Wilford, uh, the, um, the biostatistics seems to be very much part of uh, um, what you do as an epidemiologist. Can you just comment, comment very quickly on the uh, role of knowledge of statistics and how statistics is applied in, in epidemiology? Sure. So ep um, epidemiologists work very closely with biostatisticians um, in designing the studies and then also for to make sure that the data is collected is in a way that can be then analyzed to answer the questions. And then also um, the, using the statisticians to make sure you have enough sample size for what you want to answer. I think you froze up. <laughs> well, uh, it was a good start on the question. <laughs> uh, we'll uh, maybe when we get uh, Eva back, uh, we'll maybe hear the conclusion of her comments there. Uh, Josh, you know, there's some questions that uh, that have come in that that you would like to pose to the the panelists. Yeah, I guess to me, right? <laughs> Uh, so the first question uh, that was asked is, are there ways to use epidemiology and epi models for health workforce planning? For health workforce planning. Um, yes, uh, health workforce planning uh, certainly comes into, again, it's a part of managerial function. Um, hospitals, a variety of healthcare institutions have contingency planning. They have plannings uh, to respond to ec epidemics, pandemics, natural disasters, where they, they have some of the staff that is not able to reach the hospital to perform their essential duties. Others, as we are seeing now, get sick. And so uh, contingency planning and emergency preparedness planning, a key managerial function that is needed for um, to help the, the healthcare system function as best it can during a disaster situation. Uh, even beyond a disaster, would epidemiology be helpful in long-term planning of, uh, of the health workforce? So for example, understanding that the patterns of diseases may, may vary regionally, may suggest that you need one kind of health worker in one region or area and another type of worker in another, or even rural versus urban, uh, different kinds of uh, problems, health problems, present in both of those environments differently. So, uh, do you absolutely. Think, yeah. so, so one study that I'm currently working on with a local hospital is we're looking, we have done a case control, which is a kind of an epidemiological study, uh, to look at a particular uh, questionnaire that's given to uh, psychiatric patients when they are admitted to the hospital. And this is a tool that's supposedly predictive of um, whether they will readmit within 30 days or not. And so one of the goals we have in that study is to see if we can predict reasonably, and we haven't finished the study yet, so I don't have an answer, uh, if we can reasonably predict the kinds of interventions that should be created on factors we can control in this population. So for example, if gender is predictive of readmission, that's something you can't really change. But if your financial stability or your housing stability is something that's not um, under control, then while you're in the hospital, they can work on interventions to address that. And hopefully they can, they can prevent a readmission because we've, caused, we, we've provided an intervention that, that deals with one of those risk factors. Great. And one of the things we hope to get out of this is to see if we can hire, um, if it's justified to hire an additional nurse whose job it would be is to do strictly follow-up on some of these patients after they've, they have um, left up and discharged from the hospital. Again, to try to make sure they're compliant with their medication, uh, make sure that their living circumstances are conducive uh, to avoiding a readmission. So yes, that's, that's kind of a long answer to, yes, we can use those kinds of data and studies to help answer staffing questions. So that was a specific example. Okay, thank you. Josh, another question? So the uh, question is, can an epidemiologist, in parentheses, pharmacist, help with the inclusive and exclusive criteria as per the protocol in clinical trials? So that question's coming in just, I think, pharmacists and or epidemiologists. Evan, can you uh, comment on that? 
Yeah, so an epidemiologist would help. Um, they do a lot of inclusion and exclusion criteria for pretty much any study they do in determining who um, will be included or not. For example, I work on a case control study looking at birth defects, and we do a telephone interview, and our interview is only in English or Spanish. So if you don't speak English or Spanish, you're excluded from our study because we can't interview you. Um, other studies do um, exclusion based on age or gender, depending on what they're looking at. In terms of a clinical trial, epidemiologists do work on who would be included and excluded. I don't, um, for the trial, you usually have to meet certain criteria. Um, so we look at an example on medication adherence, and to be included, you have to have a certain prescription, um, access to email. So it depends on the problem what the inclusion criteria would be. Great. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm uh, looking at the next chat question, and I'd, I'd love to ask it of Jane, which is, uh, uh, or Eva, how could healthcare management personnel have better planned for the COVID-19 pandemic? Is it possible they could have planned better? Great question. That is a great question. I, I don't have enough evidence myself, frankly, to, to be able to, to give a judgment on that question. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to reserve judgment there. I, I really don't have enough, have not looked at data and, and, and don't feel I can make an informed judgment. I would just comment that uh, the, uh, there wasn't much data. Uh, you know, a few months ago, this didn't really exist. Uh, maybe it did somewhere else, or we could have looked back at SARS and, uh, and the other uh, pandemics that uh, preceded it and could have predicted it, but it, uh, I think it took a lot of people by surprise. Is that the, the sense that you get, Eva? Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's been pandemics for hundreds of years. Um, even in some of the recent flu, we've had recent flu pandemics, not at the level of COVID, but it's hard without really the data or even enough time for the data to really even know. And it's, you're always going to have pandemics. It's going to happen. I mean, or epidemics on there's outbreaks and even the smaller outbreaks, you plan as best for you as you can, but the small outbreaks still occur. I think, I think one thing I, I would say that, that I, I did hear, and, and again, this is not driven by, by any data that I have, but as they were uncovering that, that uh, race was a, uh, appeared to be a risk factor for COVID-19, there was concern that uh, health departments who were publishing in counties, public health uh, departments for the counties were not publishing and states were not publishing uh, the COVID uh, cases broken down by race. While they were giving them by age and gender, they were not including race. So not having that kind of data available in real time makes it diff can make it difficult to, to quickly assess where there might be risks that, that could be addressed. Uh, I just want to comment on, a, on another matter that came up in a discussion with the New York State Department of Health because we're working on a project with them. And um, uh, one of the issues with regard to race is the um, sometimes reluctance on the part of the frontline uh, workers to ask patients about what their race is and what they present as, what they identify it as. Uh, so uh, that has happened, and, and in some cases they take a guess, and in other cases they leave it blank, and all too often it's left blank. Mm -hmm. uh, but nonetheless, there's been a um, disparity throughout, and uh, it's, it's getting more and more notice, but uh, the lack of epidemiological data does hamper the ability of epidemiologists to draw those conclusions. And, and again, we're very early in the pandemic, so, so more data will come out. And, and so can, can an epidemiologist help us track down the origin and spread of COVID-19? And, and how so? Do you think that that is the job of an epidemiologist, Eva? Yes, um, they definitely are doing that. I know they're working um, a lot in contact tracing, especially at the Department of Health, where at, across um, departments of health across all the states, 
where they're interviewing people who are sick and asking where have you been, who have you become in contact with. Uh, I saw on social media at one of the local stewards, they said if anyone's gone to this stewards between such and such a date, there was an employee there who was positive, like contact your local health department. So there is a lot of work in trying to contain um, the spread of the disease and do some contact tracing. Okay. Um, will uh, epidemiologists be able to, to estimate the overall spread of, of the disease and, and uh, draw models to predict the, um, the spread of such a disease so that measures can be taken in the future to, to help prevent these kinds of pandemics from spreading the way they do? Yes, there, there are many people that are modeling it already. And in fact, on, in the media, we hear reports about, about the model says, this model says this. And uh, there are many models out there because uh, an important part of modeling is what assumptions are, are required. On the, on the news yesterday, I heard the report of, uh, of a model that was being produced locally that talked about the results that they gave for when they expected the peak to hit and what that peak would be was under the assumption that 75% of the people continued to be self-isolated and to, and to practice social distancing. So we get lots of, just like with the weather forecast, when we hear a storm coming, we hear the various models. There are various epidemiological models that have underlying different assumptions that use uh, different mathematical formulations. And typically with a model, the further out in time you go, because there's more uncertainty, the more um, the more uncertain that that prediction that estimate will be. Okay, uh, just a final question here um, for for both of you actually. What is it that that you wish the average person would know about epidemiology and the work of epidemiologists? What should the average person on the street know about that and and uh, why is it important? I think it's important so that you can make decisions, that, that individuals can make decisions for themselves. And in order to do that, you need to have data. You need to have the results of studies and you need to have data to help you decide, is it safe for me? And you should understand risk factors because you need, we all need to make personal decisions. There are people that have, that have postponed medical appointments, uh, routine medical appointments, because they, they are fearful of going to a doctor that they might contract COVID. And so everybody is making, all of us are making uh, choices uh, that involve various levels of risk. So I think having a basic understanding of, of using data, like, like uh, looking and looking at reputable sources, going to your public health uh, website because there they, they give you advice of things to do and they'll report what the local conditions are and that can help you in deciding what things should do. I think it's also important to have some basic understanding of some of the uh, terminology that's used like prevalence and incidence. Incidence is really the number of new cases of a disease that are presenting and prevalence uh, re refers to the number that exists. So I think we could all be better consumers if we have basic understanding of how we can use facts and data to make our own personal decisions. Eva, we'll let you have the last word on this. What do you think uh, the average person needs to know about epidemiology? I think that um, there's a lot of studies and that it does take more than one study to really make a personal decision because every study has limitations. And a lot of times when you see the news articles and they'll say, so this causes that. But when you look at the epidemiological research, it's not as strong as sometimes it's presented in the news and that it takes a lot of time, depending on the issue, it can take a lot of time to really be certain that this is the cause um, of the disease. So for example, um, like tobacco, that took years of data to really say that that tobacco causes lung cancer. Um, a lot of stuff, it'll be a strong risk factor, but to say that that definitively causes disease for a lot of epidemiology is not um, certain. Well, great. Well, thank you both and uh, appreciate this and appreciate everybody's uh, time tonight. 
I'm going to turn it back over to Josh and um, let him finish it out. Josh, I think you're muted. I just mute, tried it again. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. It, the red light wasn't on, but I appreciate you saying that. Thank you very much to all of our panelists and Dr. John Hubbards for helping walk us through the questions and help us get a better idea of what this field is and its important role in healthcare, but also for those that are trained to lead uh, not only the organizations, but all the, the professionals and those that are in the front lines working uh, in support of, of healthcare. It's just, it's so important and I'm so grateful that we were able to get on tonight to talk a little bit about this. If you have other questions that you'd like to ask of the panelists afterwards, you're certainly welcome to uh, continue typing them into the chat uh, until we do close for the evening. I see a few more questions are coming in uh, that we can certainly ask of the panelists and in a follow-up to all of those that are uh, registered for this event, we certainly can uh, provide those answers to you as well. Uh, but for those that wanted to understand further about how this field uh, has been infused within the curriculum, uh, and more importantly, just the, the important role that we feel uh, at Clarkson University in it, I just wanted to mention one of the, an interesting note about the healthcare management programs in our long history is that that course is actually required in all of the actual degree programs that we provide. Uh, the MBA in healthcare management, the uh, MS in healthcare data analytics, and the MS in clinical leadership. It is a required course in all those programs. Uh, so obviously, there's we we take this very seriously in how we educate those that are going to go on to lead organizations in healthcare. We also have a certificate, which is a six class certificate. It is an option, um, but not necessarily a requirement. But so you can see that the access on uh, the way that we present this field is so critical in everything that we we do as part of our our education and our role in terms of the mission of, of preparing the future of healthcare managers and leaders. So I just wanted to mention that quickly, that it is uh, definitely a very important part of our programs. And lastly, if, if you'd like to follow up with uh, myself uh, or any member of our team that can just provide you with additional information, or if you wanted to me to be a referral to any of our, our expert faculty, I'd uh, be happy to do that. My contact information is there. And if you or if you think somebody else would be very interested in, in continuing this conversation about uh, this particular class and its role within our programs, we do have an upcoming webinar um, Thursday, May 14th. Uh, but you certainly don't need to wait until then to ask questions if you'd like to, to visit with us. We're always available. Uh, and we've all become experts in Zoom, I think, <laughs> over the course of the past few weeks. So, um, and then if you wanted to also learn more about the programs that I've mentioned, uh, the link is there and you can click on any of the specific courses that we have, or programs, excuse me, that we have there as well. Uh, so with that, we just wanted to thank you all for joining us this evening. If you uh, would like to learn more about the programs, feel free to reach out to me uh, and I'll certainly refer you to any of our panelists, uh, our program coordinator, Dr. John Hubbard, and as well as our faculty teaching these courses in the program. Thank you so much for all your time that you devoted this evening. And before I officially close, I didn't know if our panelists or uh, our moderator uh, had any additional last thoughts. Well, thank you very much. And I, I do thank Dr. Openlander and uh, Eva Williford for joining us tonight. Uh, this was an excellent presentation. Uh, I see that there are a number of uh, questions in chat. Some of them are uh, about the specifics of the course, like when it's offered and so forth. We'll be getting back to you individually about that. And, uh, and we'll leave the chat open for a little while uh, and answer those as we can. Uh, so thank you once again, and thank you, Josh, for putting this together for us. Very much appreciate it and appreciate everybody's time tonight. Great. Good night, everybody. Thank you for coming. And we'll, we'll leave the chat open for a while here. Yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, Matthew, if you are still on that you asked a question about the slides, uh, that's something that we can certainly send in our follow up email to everybody be happy to make sure you see what the questions were asked and this contact information absolutely.
Uh, someone had asked about when the course was offered. Uh, it's offered in the spring quarter. Uh, our, our graduate programs in the Healthcare Management MBA are on a quarter system. So we have a, uh, a summer, fall, winter, and spring quarter. And uh, the, we are currently right in the middle of the spring quarter. And uh, the class is about, what, 40% <laughs> through, the, through the term. It's too late to join it for this year, but it'll be offered again next year. And it's offered both in classroom and online. Right. Good point. We All have right. two sections. So. So I think we've answered these questions. I know, Jane, you've got a class that you've got to get to. So uh, <laughs> Jane is an active teacher here and has uh, taken out time tonight just prior to this. And Eva, you do too. So thank you very much for, for uh, being with us. Very welcome. We're glad to do it. You guys can sign off and uh, we'll, we'll try and do our best to an answer this. Thank you again. Okay, you can always email us additional questions. That, that sure we will. Great. Okay, good, good night, night everyone. Good night. Well, I don't know, Josh, I think we're, we're the only to, ones here, so. Yeah, down to one other person and. Uh, yeah, I've got a, I've uh, been uh, replying to a few uh, chats here online, but. I'm uh, copying all the questions down into a Word doc that we can share with Jane and Eva and you. Good. Um, 
just in case there were any that I think there was a couple that we didn't get a chance to address that they might want to, but uh, some great questions. Very good. Yeah. Right. Thank you for setting this up. And thanks, yeah. Dennis, for uh, being part of this as well. Thank you for coming, Dennis. Okay. Well, I'm going to sign off, guys. Yep. I'm going to stop recording. Worked and, out. And, and yep.